Innovation in Conversation is proudly brought to you by Avgri, NJet, Grain SA, John Deere, Monsanto, NetBank and Sendes. Welcome to Nation in Conversation, here from the Nampu Harvest Day. I'm Theo Foster. Please follow us on Twitter at Nation Converse, or you can download the Nation in Conversation app. It is available on the App Store. You can follow news, the program, what we are going to say on the Nation in Conversation website, nationinconversation.co.za. Today we are going to talk about the role or the size of agriculture within the South African GDP. In the mid-1950s, Agriculture made up about 15% of the GDP. In the mid-60s, this was lowered to about 10%. Today, it's around about 2.5%. And, and we're going to talk about the size of agriculture and the GDP, the linkages, the effect, but also what is the importance of agriculture, not necessarily in the GDP, but in the rest of the economy. My panel today is Professor Ferdi Meyer. He's the director of the Bureau for Food and Agriculture Policy, or BFAB. Professor Johan Kirsten, Head of the Department of Agriculture Economics at the University of Pretoria. Professor Nick Funk, Chair, Department of Agriculture Economics at Stellenbosch University. And Mike Schusler, Director and Owner of Economist.co.za. Mike, I am going to start with you. GDP, we talk about the GDP and the percentage of GDP and the growth of GDP. What is GDP? What's the term GDP? Well, uh, what it actually is, in very simple terms, it's a value-added concept. So we would import a car for 100,000 rand. We would add the tires and the engine to the car, and that adds another 50,000. And then the dealer who sells the car sells it for 180,000. So in the GDP sense, that car, we added 80,000 rands worth of value in uh, the sum. Now, then the further thing, obviously, is now the person gets finance. That doesn't get added to the 80,000 rand sum. That gets added to the banking sector. So it's the value we add. The problem with what value we add is it's a very good concept, but it comes from the last century in about the 1930s when uh, uh, Keynes and so on wrote uh, uh, stuff and people started devising this and we started measuring GDP worldwide in about 1945 odd. And if we take a look today, it's very different uh, sort of things. We're measuring not so much manufacturing and agriculture, but services more and more. And it's very difficult to determine what the value add is. For example, there's a very positive value add when you have your cell phone with you and you can look at the news and that is free. So we don't measure that. GDP, that's not part of the GDP. That's not part of the GDP. And we don't measure great sunshine. But at the other end, we also struggle with um, you know, finding uh, things like the informal sector. We also don't pick up the problems early enough when an industry contracts. Um, there's a host of uh, issues with uh, GDP. Mike, in the last 15 years, and I'm going to stay with this topic, China built around 82 international airports. 30 of those airports will never see an aeroplane. Would that be counted in the GDP? Um, that would be counted in their GDP depending on how you look at it. Um, look, it, certainly when they built the thing, it would be added to the construction part. Um, obviously, when it's used, it's added to the service part. The but one that's not used, used, the one that's not used and there's no service, it doesn't get subtracted per se from GDP. Um, and that's part of the, the, the issue with GDP. I'm going to get to Yuan because he's got a, a 16th century view about GDP. <laughs> and I'm going to ask him about that. Nick, when we talk about agriculture only being 2.5% of GDP, is that a true reflection? Um, I think yes. I mean, it, 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 again, sort of getting back to this uh, notion that GDP is not a very exact uh, number and it's actually not a very satisfactory number in modern economies. Uh, there, there are people who would say that if you take agriculture and all the linkages that are connected to agriculture, that it actually comes to around about 25%. Some people even say 30%. Of but GDP. you disagree with but that? That's, no, 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 that's not true. Um, if, you measure the, if you measure it, now you have to measure it according to the way in which GDP is measured then uh, the total will come to around about six, between 6 and 
Um, but I think the, the point, and, and of course what you're measuring is um, all the inputs that go into farming, so the tractors and the fertilizer and the seed and the chemicals, you've got to measure all that. We also know that people don't eat raw commodities, you've got to add all this processing and, and, and that kind of thing. Uh, certain parts of agriculture like the wine industry and uh, the milli industry are very uh, susceptible to tourism. So you've got to add those uh, things to, to, to it as well. I'm only joking about the milli industry, right? Uh, you, you've got to add that as well. And if you add all of that together, it'll come to run about between 6 and uh, 7%. But I think we must take this uh, notion seriously that GDP is not actually a, a satisfactory uh, indication of the importance uh, of a sector, and especially not of a sector like uh, agriculture. And this is something that we've known since the you know, 16th century. Who wants to argue with me? It's not the 14th, it's the 16th century. Okay, so, but so, uh, that's where it starts. Right. Yeah. So let's take that point. Why do you believe there was three, four, five hundred years ago a better measurement? No, no, it was not a better measurement. It was the philosophy of the physiocrats, which was one of the first thinkers of economics, which argued that the only real economic activity is agriculture. But obviously, it was the only activity, in a way, because it was <laughs> subsistence production and the subsistence nature, because the only way that people could survive was uh, through the production of food and the creation of value to place through the, to the tilling the soil. So that's what where the philosophical notions of, of the only true economy comes from. But I want to bring in this whole issue of, of the GDP quickly. Um, um, there's lots of critique against the measure of GDP. Um, it's often considered to be a one-dimensional um, notion of how you measure the contribution of a sector, and Nick sort of started to allude to that. And if you start unpacking the contribution of a sector, it goes into several dimensions, which is often unmeasurable. And that, are we to, that, that's what termed sometimes the linkages. It's linkages partly, but it's also social contributions. And, um, and you need to understand the importance of food in culture. So food production and agriculture per se has an important social and cultural contribution. If you look at the festivities that goes with harvest, you know, the fact that there's a harvest day at Nampu is precisely almost like a festivity around the harvest of the maize. So the maize, many festivities in the small villages in Europe. The um, poverty role of agriculture. Many people lose their jobs in urban areas and go back to rural areas where it's actually agriculture is a safety net. And then you have the employment role and environmental role. The fact that we can take pictures in the nice winelands where Nick lives is the fact that the farmers cultivated the land, put up the vineyards at their expense, and the tourists benefit for free, in a sense, from that activity. So the contribution uh, can be measured through a range of other dimensions, not only through the GDP. Fadi, we started the discussion with GDP going from 15%, 10%, 2.5%. .5%. That's an international trend. From your point of view in South Africa, is 2.5% an accurate description of the role of agriculture? Um, to you, yeah, I think to add to the, to the debate, you know, it's, it's, people are worried that that's a bad thing, that agriculture, it's we so want small. to fight about it and say, no, it must be more, it must be more. It's a good thing. We want to have an economy... And, and that's in line with international modern economies. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and Mike, you can talk about this more, but the bottom line is, if we think about employment, for example, we want to, in, in agriculture, we cannot pay the wages that, that in your downstream economies where you can pay higher wages. So it's an unskilled... So that's from an employment point of view. But just in terms of the measurements, there are two elements in, in, in my view, and that's the one that we can measure where we already make a mistake. So we know we are under accounting for agriculture. So yes, there's a methodology around, is agri GDP a good measurement? But the, before you get to that, we under account for agriculture. And we've, we've seen that in census data versus where you really go and you look, and this is what they did for the, North, the Limpopo province. And the underestimation of agriculture value in its purest definition of the real value that you create was 10 billion rand in Limpopo, and it was physically orchards that were underestimated. So in its pure uh, value, I think we are underestimating agriculture, one. And number two, then we're really getting to the multipliers. And there it's difficult to, to really measure GDP uh, of agriculture. So I don't have a problem with 2.5% or 7%. We should really look at what does agriculture mean for the economy. And I think that's what's really coming out of the National Development Plan. I think that was their drive to talk more about these issues that Johanna, one, Johanna is mentioning. How can we 
use agriculture to get growth in the economy. And there are various ways of doing that. After the break, I'll get to you, Johan. After the break, I want to look at agriculture. We, th this year, with the, with, the, with the drought, we had the impact on food prices and how that cuts through the South African economy. And I want to then talk about the multipliers and get back to, back to you, Johan. We will be back right after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Johan, we talk about the contribution to GDP, the contribution. And we've heard Mike said GDP is a value-add concept. That 2.3, 2.5%, that's not the true reflection of the contribution. Yeah, and I think that's what Nick basically indicated just now and my sort of argument about the other contributions we should also keep in mind. But my biggest fear about the interpretation of the figure, and especially through your introduction, you said the decline from 15% to 2.3%. The interpretation that people in the street gets is that agriculture is declining. And that's a very worrying um, aspect that we need to guard against. People need to understand that the cake is growing through the economy because of the other sectors that are growing, which is very important for the transformation of the economy. You can't have an economy that is modern without a transformed notion of other sectors that are growing. So the manufacturing sector needs to grow, the services sector needs to grow, finance, etc., so that agriculture has a market. So because the other sectors are growing, your sh relative share of the GDP is declining. So we must always emphasize the relative notion of that figure. And if that figure were to come down, it just shows you that you have a more mature economy. It could be that, or it could be that the sector is declining. But there, there's always the, the notion that the, the relative uh, share is declining because the rest of the economy is growing. Mike, if we look at the current drought situation we've had, and I think we've all experienced it in food prices, and if you look at the food inflation, and specifically if you go back to the, that sector of our economy where food is their major daily expense, where 60-70% of their daily budget is allocated to food. And you look at food inflation based on the one hand a weak currency, but based on the drought. That has a very big impact on the overall economic picture, but also on the stability of the economy vis-a-vis -vis currency, uh, inflation, interest rates, and one can, one can link those to a large extent to the economy. Yes, one can. I think we must do two things. The drought is a shock, and it is definitely increasing the raw commodity values quite sharply. But here's a way that you can measure our agriculture in a different sense. If you go and look at the, the, the weights of food and beverages, for example, in the, the, the CPI basket, you're talking not 2.5%, you're talking 15%. For poorer people, you're one talking... 1.5%, 15%. One five. But ultimately... Because when you get it at the shelf, there's a package that comes with it. There's a marketing that comes with it. There's also the rent that the shopkeeper has to pay. So people have to maintain margins all the way through. And you can see that the, in South Africa, the margin squeeze on the profitability is on because the food prices on the PP. I side and on the raw material side have shot up dramatically. We have seen big increases in CPI, but nowhere close to the same levels. So the fact that the rent has gone up with 5 or 10% is nowhere close to the 100% increase in the maize price or whatever the case may be. So that combined effect when the consumer buys it means that there's only a 10 or a 15% uh, increase in his basket. It is going to get worse still, I think, on, on, on certain products anyway. But the, the point of the matter is that just shows you what the contribution of agriculture is and how we should look at it. Because by the time the consumer buys it, there's many other things added, whether it's imported, whether it's packaging, whether it's marketing, the branding, etc. And that just shows you the real contribution of agriculture. Ferdi, real contribution of agriculture, a term that's being used is the multiplier effect. That sounds like a term that academics will devise amongst themselves to, 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 um, to make sure the rest of us don't follow the conversation. What is the multiply effect? Okay, let, let's make it very practical and we link it to the, to the drought story uh, because that's exactly what it is. So if, you know, we have this effect. So this is a, let's take, that's a bread and that's the amount that wheat has. Let's say argument's sake, between 20 and 30% of your bread is that wheat value. 
So now, where does that wheat come from? Is it produced locally or is that imported? The rest of the value, the multiplier effect, that value remains there. Re the bakeries remain, the millers remain. So the transporters remain, all of those guys remain. So that's value that's created beyond the farm gate. If, now, the if question- If it wasn't for the, for, for, for the wheat, that whole value chain would not have existed. You could have imported the wheat. You can produce it locally or import it. So I'm going to bring the story now to soybeans. Let's think about the value that now comes in the multiply. I'm trying to, going to explain it this way. We've imported 80% uh, of our soybean cake, 90% that goes into the feed industry. So we have a huge amount of value that's in this sector of feed. But we never had the crushing plants. Now suddenly you have investment going on. There's a profit margin to make. People build a crushing plant. What does a crushing plant do? It kicks back an incentive for soybean farmers to grow more soybeans. Now suddenly you have a multiply effect. So instead of importing the soybean cake, you've got crushing plants crushing it. That's adding value, like Mike explained right at the start. And then you've got farmers kicking back uh, the farmer saying, okay, now it makes sense. I've got a crushing plant close to me. I can grow soybeans because the whole price relationship between soybeans and maize has changed. And those, those are the multipliers. And it's difficult to measure those to put a, name, uh, a number to it. But the, if, you know, if you take an aggregate, it's around about, for every rand that you invest in the primary sector, you get a, a 2.4 rands going, 2 rand 40 going into the uh, before the farm gate and one, one rand 80 going beyond the farm. So it depends on, but that's, that's a the, very that's aggregate the output number. That's the output multiplier. Correct. And then you have the labor multiplier that uh, every investment or every rand of output creates so much jobs. Yes. So the principle is you've got this industry. You've got, you've got soybean meal. That's your end product that goes into the feed mill. You can actually go beyond. Actually, the chickens are the final product. So you can work it all the way back and say, where does this raw product come from? Do you import it or do you, do you produce it locally? But I, can, I can explain it simpler with a story. If you look at the, the pond that you passed on the way here and you throw a stone into that pond, it makes that ripple effect. So the effect of an industry go, suddenly initiated creates a ripple effect through the rest of the economy. And the size of those ripples is basically the multiplier. Now we understand. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, again, I, I, let me make an, an, a, one other point, and that is, of course, that th this leverage that you get from these ripples also works the other way around. Yes. And this yeah. is what happens with the shock of a drought. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of those added act, uh, activities, they lose out because th what they're using to buy as inputs, that gets more expensive. And so their margins get squeezed, and so, you know, it has over, spillover effects on uh, total production, on employment, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to get back to a point uh, that I think we missed earlier when we were talking about GDP. And uh, we were all sort of very critical about the concept. Uh, the one thing we must remember is that it allows us to make proper comparisons across countries. Because even if it's a flawed and concept, over time. And, and over time, yeah, even if it's a flawed concept, everybody makes the same mistakes when they measure it. And so we can, we, you know, we, we can sort of compare South Africa's GDP to the United States uh, or other places. Um, the, the old Soviet Union never, never complied with international rules about how to measure this stuff. And so we couldn't, uh, we, you know, we don't know what really, we still don't know what happened in Russia before the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet empire. Uh, so it really has its benefits of being able to measure this thing. You know? Even if it's flawed, at Even least if, it's flawed, if yeah. everybody yeah. uses the same flawed yeah. measurement, we can measure it. Uh, and, yeah. and, it's, uh, and we must remember, it's pretty standardized through the UN stats, yeah. the concepts, where things fit in. And one country might be on revision 3.1 with manufacturing and another one on revision 4. But the, the, it's, it's just slight differences. So you can do certain things, comparisons, and it is the best at the moment that we have. Mike, just a quick point on that. We've heard last week that South Africa's GDP is now the third biggest in Africa. We've been over, overtaken last year or a year before when Nigeria rebased their statistics. They overtook us. And now during the last few months, uh, we were overtaken by the desert, um, by Egypt, um, which for me is, a, is, is it's almost strange to, have a, to be overtaken by a desert yeah. with a few I, tourist uh, attractions. But that's not the case. The Egypt, Egypt has more than 80 million people, and that's what I want to steer to. Egypt has 82, 83 million people. We've got somewhere around 53 55, million people. 55. 56. What is the importance of GDP per capita? 
well, in I this think, respect? You know, I th in, in, in all respect, I think the best measurement that we could have is a per capita measurement. Because right now, all the economists have got growth below 1%. In fact, I'm the most negative and I've got We're a We're going to get to that in the last but six. I'm just section. saying, no matter which economist you go to, if the population which is growing at 1.7% and you've got even the most optimistic one, Treasury, 0.9%, we are going to get poorer. We're going to feel poorer. Per individual. Per individual. And that's, I think, the real measurement that we should be looking at. Then you get to other concepts, like should you do it at a market rate? So Egypt overtook South Africa on purchase power parity two, three years ago. Now, on market rate, because our, our uh, decline of our currency. But then again, you know, we are richer than the Egyptians, we are richer uh, than the Nigerians. But if you look at Mauritius and you look at Botswana and Algeria, we're poorer than them. So, you know, ultimately, we, we've, we're not the richest. We're no longer that important. And our importance in every aspect and our size is starting to decline relative to others. And it's that relativity concept again, because we are still growing, but we're being outpaced by others. After the break, I want to talk a bit more specifically back to agriculture. And then in the last segment, uh, I want your views on the way forward. Where are South Africa? And I'm going to start with Mike's negative scenario and hopefully work my way through to some a bit more of a positive scenario. We'll be back right after the break. <laughs> Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Mike, when we talk about per capita, I think what for me is always uh, very, very interesting is the fact that the U.S. economy is roughly 22-odd percent of the world economy, but they've got 6 percent of the population. And we talk about the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy is probably about 13-odd percent of the world economy, but they've got five times the number of people of America. And that, I think, brings it home. But, Nick, I, I, I made a comment about Egypt. That is not the case, actually. Well, yeah, you spoke about the desert. I think um, uh, what we must remember is Egypt, as a country, is one of the biggest irrigation schemes in the world because it's the Nile, the Nile Delta. And uh, in fact, if you, I mean, we, we often don't know enough about our own continent. If you trace the big agricultural producers on the continent, Sudan, it's on the Nile River. Uh, Ethiopia, it's on the Nile River. So that, it's a, that has a massive influence in the northern part of the continent. But up to, uh, a few years ago, the, the, the World Bank was starting to get very worried about Africa's increasing dependence on food imports because uh, food imports went for the continent as a whole went from about 5% to up to 20% of, of total production. And you, you, when it gets to those levels, one has to start uh, uh, worrying. But uh, the, uh, most of the imports were of uh, grains, wheat and maize, and into North Africa. So it wasn't sort of continent-wide, it was fairly concentrated. The uh, Egyptians are now getting over the, the uh, after effects of the Arab Spring. They've got more political stability than what they had and so on. Uh, their wheat production has skyrocketed. Uh, their uh, maize production has increased by more than 30%. So, so th that sort of changed that whole equation around. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that they have the resources and they're using them. Right. But you also say that, 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 there's, a, that, that there's political stability that, 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 that again allows growth. Now, what... Well, and I want to get, I want to start to move towards that side of the of the equation. If you look at the growth rate, the GDP growth rate number difference that we've seen in, let's say, um, Eastern Germany and Western Germany, if you look at the changes we are seeing in North Korea and South Korea, it's the same populations. It's purely a different framework in which these industries operate. From an agricultural point, and I want to start with you, uh, Ferdi, if you look at the South African environment from an agriculture point, how would you describe it? Yeah, to you, sir, I, th I think it's not a secret, you know, that, and, and we went through this exercise very recently again, looking at where is growth? Where can agriculture still provide the growth? And immediately, if you talk to the companies, that comes up as one of the, they are like three critical factors. The one, and we specifically looked at high value commodities that we can export or the vulnerable industries like your chickens, like your, your wheat industries, where we're seeing a decline or a lot of pressure. And, and your comments are always the same. Politically, they're worried the investment doesn't flow. So that was one of the issues raised. The second one is trade barriers, non-tariff trade barriers, or 
you know, it's just simple paperwork not being signed, not having that support. They want to grow, but it's not there. And the third one is just availability of water and the cost of electricity and labor. So those were the, the, the three critical drivers that, that we picked up, and, and I think here amongst ourselves we know this. These are the key in, uh, the factors, and we need to think about it saying, okay, so this is the reality around political environment. What do we do with this in the, within this environment? Saying, are there opportunities of growth? What are the actions that we need to take as an industry and taking government along? Yeah, I think it's very important, maybe just to add to that, the investment decision of any entrepreneur depends on certainty, you know, certainty that there would be a return, and that return depends on your policy certainty and, and political stability. And I think we in South Africa are now faced with lots of political uncertainties and so on, which therefore creates a problem of more investment, lower growth, etc. So I think we're very concerned. And that links me back to the water story, because uh, Fadi neglected to mention, Nick as well, that in the National Development Plan, to grow the agricultural sector, the investment in irrigation infrastructure, more dams, more water available for agriculture, is an important driver of greater agricultural growth. I think if I look at agriculture, I think the value add that uh, we can get for the country in total when we look at the whole production chain is going to go away from the sort of commoditized agricultural products to specialized agricultural products. And one can use the wine industry, one could use pecan nuts, one could use uh, macadamia nuts. We're finding a lot of places in South Africa that are moving into places where they add value. They take the nuts, they uh, add different nuts together or uh, we do. Uh, we, add, we, we talk we, about we, nuts, we, not about economists. Yeah. Well, better. You know, the, 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 the people that are that are better decision makers than economists are people who have to make a decision about their own future and their own um, income and their own profitability. Exactly. And as a small businessman, I can tell you, you do not want to be the fiftieth person with the same product to go to see someone. You want to go for something unique, and that is where we can add the value right through the fruit chain, and we have Africa just north of us that is waiting for our product, I think. It's an opportunity that we can un uncover, but we have to create that certainty. We, we talked about investment in agriculture, and we talked about the decisions, the investment decisions. I see Dr. Pete Krokamp is in the audience. I, um, I want to ask Pete a question as a lead to the rest of the conversation. Um, Pete, as you well, as you might know, um, has a, a very popular television series where he talks to the biggest, most successful farmers in South Africa, Megabura, as it's called. But when, if you look at how these mega farmers approach investment and investment decisions, because what we want to do is I want to follow on to that and then lead into the uncertain economic environment. If they look at investment decisions, what factors do they take into consideration? And how do they make their decisions? Well, I think that uh, one of the important things, and uh, you guys have alluded to too, is that uh, too many farmers in South Africa are price takers. And to avoid being a price taker, farmers try to get into a value chain. And if they get into the value chain, they go into that ripple effect that you have referred to. In other words, they want to get into other uh, sectors of the economy, get involved, or their particular industry being involved in, in the broader sector, or other spheres of the, of the economy too. And then, of course, uh, the, the last uh, step is, is perhaps to get involved in international markets. And I think more and more farmers have realized that uh, you're not going to get a lot of state assistance for that. And you're really on your own. And what they do is they pursue markets on their own. So many of the big farmers in South Africa, they create their own markets. They stimulate their own markets. If you, if you wish, they start opening uh, factories and packing stores and stuff in Europe. So they, that what they do is they broaden their footprint within agriculture and in not only one industry, also beyond agriculture, they get into the tourism, manufacturing, etc. all the things that you guys refer to. And the, the, the nice thing about it is that the same set of expertise, the entrepreneurship, the peripheral vision that is required to be a successful mega farmer you can use by getting involved in a broader sector of the economy and other spheres of the economy as well. And I think that's more or less the headspace that they operate in is just so much bigger than I think that we used to of agriculture and of the typical farmer. Thanks, Pete. Mike, Pete talked about increasing your footprint, increasing what you do. That would also mean, am I right, that the measurement of that activity well, only a portion will be added to the value add in GDP. The rest, or well, agriculture, agriculture GDP, yes, yeah. the rest will be added in various yes, sectors. Yes, yes. I mean, the minute you take the grapes, 
from the plant. The, the, the grape value is, is at the farm. You make wine, it's at the factory. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very different thing. The same with any other agricultural product. And that's why I think we have to think beyond agriculture when we start looking at the future of this industry. And we need that political certainty, but we also need that support um, from government because this must be an, a, one of the most incredible success stories ever in the world where tariffs have come down, no protection, uncertainty about land ownership, all the type of negativity that's aimed by politicians at a, a certain group of people. It is an absolute, absolute success story in those type of terms, and it's not seen that way. The government would rather spend 20 billion rand a year on cars and, and subsidizing for 34,000 workers there. Agriculture is over 800,000. The value chain, probably about 2 million, if you look at it in the bigger picture, from advertising agencies and packages and whatever. So we're looking at a very, very different uh, 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 scenario. If we use that 20 billion and we turned it around, and we did that, we, would ha we wouldn't have half the unemployment in the rural areas right now. How, how are we going to get away from this agriculture, and I'd, I want to move slightly, or I want to stay clear of pure politics, how are we going to move away from the government viewing agriculture as us and them? We're going to talk about that in the next session. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Me and Peter and Nick. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, it, it is a, a big challenge, you know, and I think that's... I think probably Francois and his company with starting this conversation is trying to bring that forward. You know, I think we, we try to bridge that gap, you know, us and them and actually talk frankly about agriculture and we need to do that. But I think Mike has mentioned a very important point we often ignore is this important role that agriculture can play in terms of employment creation. You know, the, um, the fact that there's between 600 and 800,000 people that are employed, you know, depending on the numbers, and you add, multiply that with five, which is the typical household, you can understand that the large number of people in our country depending on the sector, which is therefore also a very important political um, tool in the negotiations and arguments about the role of agriculture and why you should support it. So I think that is uh, um, still an important dimension. But the us and them story, Nick is an expert in us and them, so you can ask him about how you deal with that. <laughs> I'll get you back in the next session. <laughs> the, uh, no, I'm not, I think uh, what, what I want to talk about is just to get a perspective on the agricultural growth that we've had in, uh, in, in South Africa, just to agree with Mike, because it really has been pretty much of a miracle. Uh, when, when I start off, you're not going to think I'm all that positive about it. The average growth in agriculture over the last 20 years across the continent of Africa has been around about 5% a year. Now, it's off a relatively low base, but it's been going on for more than a decade, so it's, it's quite impressive, the, the growth rate. Uh, South Africa's has been between 2 and 2.2%, so it's a lot lower than that. Um, the, the argument that we have is that uh, the, the, the evidence, what it points out to, is that people in the sector have enough confidence in, in what's going on around them uh, to maintain the current production capacity. Now, you must remember, if you want growth, you have to have investment. Uh, you, can, you, you can have all sorts of other things. There are a lot of other things that, uh, that growth is dependent on. But without investment, there's no growth. So what you can do is you can maintain your production capacity by reinvesting and just maintaining that, uh, that production capacity, or you can Im increase it, of course. And what's happening in South Africa, it looks like, as if we're not, we don't have enough confidence to, uh, to increase the production capacity. We do have, we have the ability to do it, and we have the resources to do it, we know that, but it, does, it looks as if they don't have the confidence. And until we can get uh, our growth rates up to the level that, uh, that, they, that we have across the rest of the continent, uh, we're not gonna be in a very competitive position in uh, serving those African markets, which are the fastest growing in the world at the moment, and where we have actually done very well over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm going to come back after the break, and uh, you can see that thing is now yellow. It's telling me time up, and I'm two minutes past my time. I'll come back after the break. We'll be back right now. <laughs> Welcome back to Nation in Conversation. Ferdi, we noted uh, just before the break about policy certainty and the, the, this us and them principle. Your thoughts? Yeah, Tio, I think the most important thing, and we talked about these good conversations taking place, 
between, uh, between the policy and, and private sector, public-private typical discussions taking place. And there what comes up consistently is just define the rules of the game. And that's the, a that's the certainty, uncertainty part. We know there, there needs to be transformation in agriculture. And, and the agricultural industry, both public and private, there's, there's agreement on that. We just need to define the rules of the game because then you can define where the profits lie. So profits are linked to the investment, obviously, and that's what we want. So what's the catalyst for investment to take place? And there are various mechanisms that you can look at. So that's what we've tried to define now is being more art to articulate the, the catalysts that we require in agriculture to re revitalize growth. And these are global cycles. I mean, we, we need to know that we have faced not only with a drought, but globally, commodity prices are low. They're very low, and agriculture will always do it. And it has to do it because we're driving productivity. So the more productive we are, the, the, the lower are the prices in real terms. And if you're on that productivity curve, you'll be growing in future, and you'll invest in future. But what are the key catalysts? So water, we need to look at our water. Where are the opportunities of growth? Now, the National Development Plan, I think people don't see it in context. It's not 500,000 hectares or half of expansion in total area. We won't achieve that. We know we have a shortage of water. We can achieve about 10% expansion and irrigation if we save water and if we focus that water at the right place. Secondly, export-orientated commodities. There are very specific actions that we need to take to open up markets. If you just compare our competitors like Chile, Argentina, Brazil, their access into Asian markets compared to ours, there's serious homework that we need to go and do there to open up those markets. And thirdly, if we can just get a fund that defines and says, look guys, this is, these are the key hubs of investment here, are true business these are investment opportunities that make business sense and define also from a political perspective what are the rules of the game in, into the future because then you'll invest. And that's something very important also for export orientated crops. Here we're talking about investments of five to ten years at least. And, and that's why you need that certainty uh, and, and the rules of the game. And then the you can invest. And the regulations. And we, you talk about certainty in the rules of the game. Last night, we had the Minister of Finance issuing a document which, if I look at it, it's a pledge or a, a cry for South Africans to please support Treasury. Um, that's not what one wants to hear. Mike, your view on where the current economic environment is, I know you are one of the more pessimistic analysts, given the specific sectors that you believe are not in the shape they should be, your view. Well, let's put it this way. I was always the optimistic one. And I think the way I saw the commodity super cycle go um, just made me very worried. And in that context, um, the sort of fights that we're having and the, the backroom scenes that we don't know about in our government at the moment is increasing the uncertainty, is increasing the risks. During the commodity cycle at the moment, our profitability of the economy is going down. So our profits are not compensating for that increase in risk, to put it very, very plainly. We, are, we, we probably did not pick up the increase in unemployment last year because the master sample changed. The questions and stuff also changed slightly. With that meant that we didn't get a nice trend analysis on the unemployment side. Now where we are now, we're finding that there's a huge jump in the first quarter of unemployment. This is a very, very big problem. We are marching towards 10 million people being unemployed. We are at 8.9 million. We are in every sense that is a political catastrophe, catastrophic event. Any country in the world will see it as such. Yet here, the focus at the moment of the ruling party is internal. It is fighting amongst itself. This is not good for us. So I really do not see where the general economic growth comes to that. Add the drought shock, add the low commodity prices, add the slowing economy worldwide, and you've got a recipe for a disaster at the moment. Are we on the brink of a recession, two consecutive quarters of negative growth? Well, I think the first quarter is, is probably going to be negative. Um, just 
your big drop in mining means that that takes away 1.4% of GDP. Manufacturing uh, uh, adds about 0.4 again. So we're still minus, but then we have a, a, a small minus in electricity already. I'll see where all the other stuff comes. But I think ultimately, I think we're already in, in, in a decline. Um, the second quarter may be better because of the holiday shift, um, but the third quarter is also not looking good for me at the moment, um, and I really don't see where the growth is going to come from at the moment, um, and if we don't do something quickly, then we're also going to get the downgrade, because the rating agencies are going to relook at us. If we're getting poorer as a people, then poorer people can lend m less money. That's the way they, they view it. It's as simple as that. The... Uh at the media launch on Monday night, uh, Ruf Meyer uh, described South Africa um, in a way that I think might be of value. He said, we are a underperforming going concern. Um, let me start with your view on the economy going forward, Johan. Yeah, I think Mike has actually mentioned everything that is uh, important. You know, um, the predictions that I have is around 0.4% growth. We are probably not in negative growth yet, but we have been declining the positive growth over the last uh, few quarters. So obviously, we doesn't look good, you know. And, and the rating agencies have given us some chance. Whether this political turmoil that you've referred to now is going to change that is is, is quite worrying. So I think that is, uh, in my mind, I think Mike has actually summarised it perfectly. Nick, where does that leave agriculture? Um, let me let me sort of start, start, uh, start at the other at the broader end of it is that um, the one thing I've learned uh, in studying economies is what goes down will come up again. So uh, you know we, we we're in trouble now, but uh, you know it's not going to last for too long, hopefully. Um, it, it, agriculture is, is I think in a sense uh, immune to uh, the general economic circumstances. Uh, obviously, people have to buy food, and if they don't have money, then agriculture is in trouble. But specifically because of what we said earlier. The food component of uh, what people buy is relatively small. And uh, so there's always a market for agricultural uh, products. And uh, farmers, farmers are used to the fact that when prices go down, they have to produce more in order to uh, maintain their incomes. And when prices go up, they also produce more so that they can make more profits. So, you know, recessions are things that don't affect them as badly as what they do uh, other parts of the economy. It's not to say they're not affected, but the, the, the relative uh, impact is smaller. So, uh, so agriculture will go through this. Uh, it's, uh, the, the commodity super cycle is probably more important for agriculture than what the, uh, you know, the, res the recession um, has been. And uh, it'll get through this, and when times are good, then the farmers will keep on producing more uh, just because, uh, because they can make more money. Ferdi, if you look at this environment and you heard what people were saying, from an agricultural investment point of view, your, your view? Now, to, so the reality, I mean, we talked about the reality, what it is. Uh, Nick has already started to, to point into the direction what, what goes down must, has to come up. So what's, what, are the, what do the clever people tell us about investment? When do you invest? You invest when it's at the lowest. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, it comes down to the rules of the game. If we can have some certainty, and, and this is where everybody has to play a role. And I think this is, this is probably, in my view, I think South Africa is going to come out of this event different than what we, what we went into this event. And if you look at the, the history the, uh, all across the world, a lot of times you, know, you, you go through these cycles, and, and one of these cycles is just deeper, uh, more wider. And it's a, a lot of times, it's just a, a confluence of events, things taking place. And then you get a shift. You get a, a regime shift. You get a political shift. And again, my, my view is there's so much opportunity in the, in the food industry itself. We have the infrastructure. If you guys go up into Africa, compare that. We have the skills. We have a huge amount of benefits in just the right things that are in place actually to, to still invest. And if you take the view that we're going to get out of it, it might take three or four years uh, and, and might look different. We Hopefully it's a positive, different view that we get out of it, the regime shift that we get. I think it's a positive uh, signal to invest. Well, Andre Pierre Brink talked about the joy of uncertainty. And I think that's why every farmer wakes up in the morning, it's a joy of uncertainty. And that's why I buy season tickets at Loftus, the joy of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> to my panel, thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a great discussion. I think you put 
GDP into perspective. And the fact that agriculture is only 2.3% of GDP doesn't mean a hell of a lot in the bigger scheme. Thank you very much. Thank you for Nation in Conversation. Please, you can follow us on Twitter, Nation Converse, or you can visit the website, nationinconversation.co.za. You're also welcome to download our app. It is available in the App Store. From me, Theo Foster, good day. The world is changing today. The world is changing in every way. Let's stand together. Put our hands together. Join hands forever. We're making it better. No matter.